Hey everyone, welcome back and let's write some more neat code today. So today let's solve the problem, filter elements from array. I believe this is day five of the JavaScript challenge. It's a pretty similar problem to yesterday. We're given an array. It's a pretty similar problem to yesterday, but I'm gonna go through a couple of important details about JavaScript as a language, just because we have the time. We're given an integer array and a filtering function, and we want to return a new array with fewer or equal number of elements. If you're not familiar with filtering functions, this last sentence might confuse you. What do they mean by a new array with fewer or equal number of elements? Well, think about what filtering is going to do. Take a look at this example down here. We have an array with four elements, zero, 10, 20, and 30. We have a filter function that checks if a value is greater than 10. If it's greater than 10, it looks like we're returning true. If it's not greater than 10, we are returning false. So as you might guess, this function is going to look at each element and determine if it's greater than 10. And for the ones that are greater than 10, we're going to create a new array with those elements. Zero is not greater than 10, neither is 10 but 20 and 30 are, so that's what we get in the output. So that kind of satisfies the requirement of fewer or equal number of elements. That's kind of what filtering does by definition. And in terms of coding it up on the right over here, all we have to do is just take this array. Every array has a method, just like every array has a method map, which can take each value and map it to a new value. It also has the method filter, where it will do exactly what we talked about earlier. Now it has to be provided some function because how exactly are we going to filter these? Like what exactly is the criteria? If we wanted to recreate the greater than 10 function that we were given in example one, we could do so with a Lambda function or an inline line anonymous function like this, where the parameter is going to be just like they told us over here, the array value and the index. So here I'm going to just create a couple of variables for those. I'm going to call it n and I'm going to call the second one i. n is going to be the value. i is going to be the index. We don't have to pass these in. Remember, we're just creating a function here that we're passing into the filter function. And then this function will be called underneath the hood. This is kind of an example of declarative programming because we are not explicitly writing this out. This is sort of functional programming. If we were to do it the opposite way, where which I'm going to do later on, that is going to be an example of imperative programming. And I'll show you that in just a second. But for now, let's finish up this function. How do we decide what to return? Well, to create a function, let's create our curly braces and then define the function, just kind of like they did over here. I'm just gonna go ahead and copy that. Return n is greater than 10. So this will obviously not pass the problem because we're not doing what they told us to do because it's pretty much a trivial problem to solve. But this is an example of filtering. And if you wanna get even more fancy, you can get rid of these braces, these curly braces, and get rid of the return statement because this anonymous function is just a single liner and it's returning the value anyway. Let's get rid of the semicolon as well. And this is equivalent to the previous code that we had. But now let's actually solve the problem. I'm going to, instead of passing in the function we defined, I'm going to pass in fn, the function they passed into us, and I'm going to return this and then run it to make sure that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. The only problem is they told us we're not allowed to use a built-in filter method. So let's solve this the imperative programming way where we actually explicitly write out the steps we manage our own state. So I'm going to first build the new output array. Well, initially it's gonna be an empty array result. And then I'm gonna go through every single element n in the input array. But remember, in is not the keyword you use to access the value of a data structure, whether it's a object or an array. If we want the values, we use the keyword of. Now with each of these values, we just wanna apply the filter and then decide whether we should add it to the result or not. So easiest way to do that is with an if statement, right? Let's call fn on the n value as well as the index. But then we realize we actually don't have the index. So we remember to get the index from an array, we actually do have to use the keyword in. So good that we are reviewing these concepts. So now I'm going to change this to i because it's the index. So now we can pass the index in, but how do we get the actual value n? Well, we can do that by array at index i. 
And we reviewed last time that this is actually a string when you iterate through it like this. So we can cast it to a number and then we can finish up our if statement here. If this evaluates to true, then we want to our result push the value array at index i. And then after that, we just need to return our result. I'm going to comment this out and then run the below code to prove that it works. And as you can see, yes, it does, but it is quite a bit slower. That's mostly, I think, because we are creating a new dynamic array and potentially resizing it many, many times. Array filter will actually update the array in place, but we are not allowed to do that. So we can go with this approach very quickly. I think it's also worth mentioning that we could and probably should iterate through this just with a pointer index I because having to convert a string to a number can be error prone and you might not remember to do that. It can cause bugs sometimes. So usually it's better to actually iterate through arrays like this array dot length and then I plus plus. So this syntax is pretty similar to most languages, except of course, Python. So what we're doing here is declaring a variable with the let keyword. We can't use the const keyword because we are going to have to increment this pointer I. So I'm going to use the let keyword and we're going to keep going until we're in bounds of the array and increment on each iteration of the loop. So initially we start at index zero and we do not have to convert this to a number now, though I think it would technically work if we did. But let's run this code now and see if it works. And as you can see, yes, it does. Now, lastly, I want to take a couple of minutes to quickly skim through the editorial because I think there are a couple nuggets of knowledge in here that we didn't really have to learn about in the problem, which kind of makes me wonder why they include this in the editorial. But oh, well, one is that JavaScript has this concept of truthy and falsy values, and many languages do, including Python. The idea is that when you write if statements, we know that the statement is evaluated based on whether it is a true or whether it is a false, but actually non-Boolean values such as integers like zero can also be used in if statements. What would this execute? This would be false. Zero is false. What about an empty string? Well, usually that's false. If we were doing this in Python, we would also get the same result. And they list a bunch of other things that are considered falsy, which one is the false value itself, the number zero, the number negative zero, not a number, which usually happens when you try to divide by zero, an empty string, a null value, and the undefined value. Undefined is a bit special in JavaScript. Most languages don't really have this concept. The idea is that when I declare a variable such as const n is going to initially be equal to null, n is explicitly set to null. But what happens if I actually don't set n to anything? What's this going to be? It's going to be undefined because we never assigned it. That's the distinction between null and undefined. Null you have to be explicit about, but undefined is pretty much always going to be there. You can't really avoid running into undefined values in JavaScript. Even in TypeScript, you sometimes can't avoid that. Now they do mention here that sometimes it can be dangerous. Like this if statement over here, if user input isn't null and it isn't an empty string, then do some operation, which can be shortened to this statement below. But that could be dangerous because what if user input is the value zero up here, like the integer zero? then what would happen? Then this if statement would not execute. But do we want it to execute? Perhaps we do. In that case, it's worth being explicit like this. It's worth being explicit to check if a value is actually not equal to null. Maybe we are allowed to use zero. We're just not allowed to use null or an empty string. Sometimes you find me writing stuff out like this in leak code problems just because I don't want to confuse myself. There's also this concept in JavaScript that the conditional operators can actually be used for assignment. What this is doing here is if the text input variable evaluates to false, then the string value will be assigned to what comes after the or conditional here. In many languages, this is not the case. I don't believe this would happen in Java or C++. You would probably get a type error because you're not allowed to use a string in a or condition. But in Python, this actually does work. Just to quickly prove it to you, I'm going to write print false 
or some string like hello. So what will happen with this? Will this print false? Will this print true? Because shouldn't this evaluate to a truthy value? So technically this condition should evaluate to true, but actually it doesn't. As you're about to see when I run this code, we actually get an output of hello because the first part of the condition evaluates to false. So the rest of the condition is what is actually returned here. So we could even assign this to a variable over here in Python, let's say just n for no reason. And then when we print the n value, we'll kind of get the same thing, we'll get hello. But now if I try to use that same n value in a conditional down here and then try to print something, maybe I'm gonna print world now, you'll see that this time the n value is gonna do something different. The n value here evaluates to true because even though the value here is assigned to a string in the presence of an if, this will turn into a conditional true or false, a Boolean value actually. So I know this is Python, but actually JavaScript operates the same way. I just wanted to show you a different language. And another thing that's worth knowing is the nullish coalescing operator in JavaScript. This is pretty handy dandy in many cases because it operates similarly to this thing over here, where if this part evaluates to false, everything else is what's returned. So down on the right over here, if I do an assignment, n is gonna be equal to some empty string, but if that empty string is falsy, then do everything after, then assign it to what comes after the string, which might be hello. So if this evaluates to false, then the double question mark will execute the rest of this part of the code and then assign it to this variable. So that's just kind of a shorthand way of maybe even writing out a ternary operator. Like this would be equivalent to if I wrote down here, const n is equal to empty string, but if that is equal to empty string, if empty string is true, otherwise, we are going to assign this to hello. I believe these two lines of code are equivalent. If this is true, it'll be assigned to n. If it's not, it'll be assigned to hello. Now skimming through the rest of this article, I don't believe there's anything crazy that we haven't talked about yet. I think the rest of these solutions we covered last time. So I will close things off by mentioning that JavaScript is a weakly typed language. They mentioned that also in this editorial, but I'm sure they're gonna talk about it more in the future JavaScript challenges. So that's where I will leave things. But Python, if you're familiar with it, is not quite a weakly typed language. It's sort of a strongly typed language, though it's not like the strongest. But this is just a bit of food for thought if you're interested in researching something else. I'll probably cover these concepts in future videos if you're interested. So definitely subscribe if you want more. Thanks for watching and I'll see you soon.